Well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, today we have uh, kind of a, a new thing. We have two guests uh, from the Veterans Health Administration. We have Dr. Ann Lord Bailey, who is the Director of Clinical Tech Innovation. And we have Caitlin Rollins, who is the Deputy Director of Clinical Tech Innovation. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for uh, joining us today and trying out this four-person podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Uh, so I'd love to, kind of where we always like to start is we want to hear a little bit about your own personal journey into XR, uh, especially maybe as it relates to your work now with the VA. And, and maybe if one of you wouldn't mind also just sharing a little bit about kind of the background, like what, what is the VHA and, and kind of the, the clientele you're serving, et cetera. Would, that'd be a great way for us to start. Absolutely. So I can kick us off. I'll start talking a little bit about VHA. So uh, we talk about, you hear VA a lot of times, VHA is a, a, the health administration part of the Veterans Affairs. We serve 9 million enrolled veterans. We have almost 400,000 staff um, in healthcare systems, 171 healthcare systems across all 50 states in Puerto Rico and, and other places as well. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity um, to really impact the broader healthcare uh, landscape when you, when you get to do things in VA. So I am actually a pharmacy practitioner by training. I did my residency in VA. I've grown up in VA. I love working with veterans. Um, early in my career, started specializing in hepatitis C and working in innovative healthcare models. And then um, had the opportunity to start an innovation program at the VA in Asheville, North Carolina, which is where Caitlin and I met. Our stories definitely intersect at XR. Um, as the innovation specialist, and Caitlin was a bedside nurse at the time, I'll let her tell the rest of that story, but that's where, where she and I met, was talking actually about um, her VR project there um, in Asheville. Yeah, and as, as Anne mentioned, I'm a, a registered nurse by clinical background. That's how I started my career in the VA. Uh, similar to Anne, I actually did my kind of transition to practice my clinical internship uh, with the VA and in the emergency room at the Asheville VA prior to completing my second nursing degree and fell in love with the veteran population. I come from a, a family of veterans. My partner is a veteran um, and just fell in love with the culture of the VA, um, which is extremely supportive. You'll, you'll find actually happy employees uh, that aren't jaded about their jobs, um, which is not always the case in healthcare. So it was a really exciting place to be. Um, as a new nurse in the VA, I noticed really quickly a need for more non-pharmacological options for pain management and anxiety management. I worked as a bedside nurse on a post-operative ward and was giving out opioid pain medications, didn't have a lot to, to give my patients, and started looking into extended reality as an option. Um, as a non-pharmacological, non-invasive intervention for those patients. Um, so I did, you know, I did all of the like literature reviewing, like looking at what the evidence was at that point. And in 2017, you know, most of the literature was not really, uh, was not really in clinical implementation. It was primarily in like experimental settings, academia, um, and less so in actually just using it with patients. Um, but I still utilized that that information that I found in the literature to kind of present this to leadership um, and got a uni unanimous approval from my nursing service at the time, um, which I'm very grateful for because it led Ann and I down this uh, long six-year path to where we are right now. Uh, but they unanimously approved the purchase of the first two virtual reality systems that I used with patients. Um, you know, we went through a lot of hurdles in that process to getting from idea to actually the first patient that we used virtual reality with in our healthcare system. Uh, it was, you know, close to a year long process of getting approvals, getting things funded, getting vendors vendorized in the VA, uh, which is a whole separate conversation. Uh, but we finally used it with our first patient at the Western North Carolina VA at July 18th, 2018. Um, and, you know, I connected with Anne very shortly after that, um, as I had kind of done an initial four month pilot and was really wanting to, to spread it further. And Anne, as my innovation specialist, was the person to potentially help me do so. So we connected then. And uh, the rest, uh, you know, is the history we'll talk to you about today. That's, uh, that's awesome. That's very, very impressive. Uh, the VA is definitely close to my heart. My mother-in-law was a nurse there for almost 20 years or more. And my wife, who's a doctor now, she spent her middle school, high school years volunteering at the VA. So uh, love the VA. And I, so I'd, I'd love to start with maybe 
Caitlin, like tell us more of the details. I mean, 2017 in, in XR years was a long time ago. In normal years, it wasn't that long ago. It's true. Um, but that's pretty early days. Um, what, just the very initial, you know, selling that to your leadership. Maybe you kind of go deep there, but how, how did you do that? What were some of the questions? How did you overcome um, objections, et cetera? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and I agree with you. Like one one year in XR is it's like dog years. You know, it's like seven years and like real like I don't know. There's some weird conversion there that happens. Um, but yeah, in 2017, you know, I did some research and that I couldn't find any other VAs using XR, which Anne and I have found over the past several years that there were a few using XR. At that same time, I was exploring it, but in siloed efforts. And specifically around prolonged, imaginal prolonged exposure therapy. Um, so we have, we've found these over the years uh, working, you know, working towards spreading this. But that initial pilot that I was, I was looking at doing on that single inpatient ward, it was really a matter of getting initial buy-in from leadership um, and having their support. Um, gratefully, the Asheville VA were... Anne and I come from originally uh, has a really strong culture of shared governance um, with its nursing staff, uh, which if you're not aware of that, it basically means that there's a lot of different nursing councils and work groups, and they help make a lot of the decisions in the hospital, um, which is not necessarily the case in most private sector hospitals or even in most VA hospitals, uh, shared governance doesn't always exist. So that kind of culture allows you to present ideas as a bedside nurse to solve a problem you've identified and have an entire group of people making up all of the areas of the hospital make a decision on whether or not to push that forward or not from that particular point. So that was a, a, the initial piece of it. Once I got initial approval through the Nursing Practice Council, Nursing uh, Research and Clinical Inquiry Council, then it went to Executive Nursing Council or their, their work group. Um, and that's where I actually had to present the evidence. Like this is the evidence that exists currently for it. This is how much it costs. This is like the risk associated with it. These are the potential benefits out of it. Um, and really just trying to sell that idea. You know, this is how many like morphine milliequivalents of opioids that we have to give on this post op board on, you know, a given day. And that's a lot. And that's not something that we should do. This provides us a new alternative um, to, you know, to typical pain management, or at least not as even as an alternative, but sometimes just as an adjunct to decrease, uh, the amount of, uh, medication needed, decrease that dosage, increase the amount of time between doses. So I sold it wow. to them. That was basically like, you know, selling it to them. And so they approved it, started that pilot, but then the data started to speak for itself. And Anne can attest to this. So she was present for some of those initial sessions with patients. Um, as we started using it with different patient populations, but the the patient reaction to virtual reality in particular speaks for itself. So if you have a patient that's in 10 out of 10 pain, writhing, can't get any relief from anything else, and you put them in a VR headset, and 10 minutes later, they are fast asleep, that speaks for itself. You know, you didn't use any medication, and all of a sudden that patient is at peace, they're comfortable, that's huge. So, you know, at that point, you don't you don't have to do as much of the buy-in part of it because the data you're collecting and the patient candid remarks about that experience really help push it forward. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that, we've seen that again and again in different use cases. And it, it it's hard to, I mean, this is a very meaningful use case. And I do just want to say, I mean, it's it's impressive. And I think it's something that those of us in XR really appreciate, Caitlin, that you you went through that process, right? Like yeah. that you recognized it, you took the time. I mean, it's it's really, really cool. And yeah, I mean, we all know the, the, the side effects of opioids and any way you can reduce, you know, the usage of opioids. Um, but, but that's what we see too. Again, maybe not, and not as, you know, this is a very impactful use case, but it's once you get them in the headset, once the results are there. And it's pretty cool to see there's kind of like this, I don't know if it's a groundswell yet, but there's kind of this behind the scenes thing happening in XR where in enterprise and education and healthcare, there's all these really, really impressive use cases where people that are using it are seeing, wow, we're learning faster, we're training faster, retention rate is higher, we're not using as much pain medication. I mean, it's almost like, what? Like, this is nuts, you know? And there's people like you all behind the scenes pushing this thing forward, um, which is really, really awesome. I know Will has some questions on, on scope, but even just going back, 
and dog years or whatever it is, VR years. So I just want to have a visualize or a visual for the first. Was this like with a vibe? Did, were you setting up base stations like in the patient room or how, how and where did the content come from in 2017? Uh, these were definitely tethered devices. They were tethered to, you know, okay. like high powered gaming laptops and we yeah. had them on mobile, like metal lockable carts. So we would have like the laptop there, the VR headset and the controllers, and you'd like wheel it into the patient's room and then have to like plug everything in, get the laptop wow. turned on, like get, uh, you know, the Windows like media stuff running. And it was, it was a process without, you know, without a doubt. So the, where we've come to now, uh, like Anne can tell you, she, she takes virtual reality headsets with her, like wherever she goes at this point, And that was not not possible and no cart she doesn't need a cart no what? cart even <laughs> prove it <laughs> yeah, prove it there you go proving it <laughs> I'd, I'd love to zoom out a little bit i kind of want to understand the scope of, of 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 the activity within the va talk about yeah like what are the different use cases that are active right now how many clinics how many what could you share about the scope yeah, so I can I can talk about that a little bit. I think the the work that Caitlin did was incredibly foundational at the local medical center. And what we know is that once one VA has accomplished something like this, it really opens the door. But it doesn't mean that it naturally grows. Um, and so while Caitlin was really digging in deep to to lay the foundation, um, I started looking for others at a national level who had done things even in other areas that had scaled across the country. Um, at the time, Beth Ripley, who um, is currently the acting chief in our office. She had done a lot with building uh, networks of people around advanced manufacturing. And so it started to make sense to think about, for us to start thinking about XR as a community, as collaboration. And that has been really foundational to, to us and to the growth from this point. Um, and so pretty quickly, you know, Caitlin and I worked together on some applications to get her some more funding and were told no twice. Uh, by the Office of Innovation. The office that we now work for actually told us no uh, initially. And see Wait, how, how do you say no to those results? Sorry, how do you say no to like less drug usage? Like, well, I don't you're, get you're, it. You, look, that, we had the same question, so we also would not accept no as an answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and so we we're like, okay, yeah. clearly you guys, we're just not articulating this well or something. Um, so we just continued mm, to to press forward to build a community. And you mentioned a groundswell. That's exactly what we've seen in VA. And so when we had our first community of practice, um, we had five different med we had five different medical centers represented, um, and about ten staff. And pretty quickly, everybody realized that Caitlin was the one that had all the experience. Everyone else had a lot of interest and had done some things. Um, she had done um, more and had developed some of those repeatable processes. And so that group of people really started to grow organically. And it was very much, we, we were using email to pass standard operating procedures back and forth. And then we recognized an opportunity to develop a, a Teams page actually. And so now our Teams page has, um, we keep files and folders of all the projects that are happening across the entire country. We, people ask questions, we keep um, resources. We have a playbook uh, for how you implement uh, XR in VA. We actually now have a public version of that. Um, we have an intro guide where it's things are defined. What does it? What does XR mean? What does VR mean? What does AR mean? What are degrees of freedom? Those kinds of things, as well as lists of all the vendors that are being used in VA right now, with where in the hospital those might be used, what clinical indications, um, and those kinds of things to really just look. Our our goal, our role has been to lower the barrier to implementation. So to get to your question about scope. Um, that group of, of about five medical centers and 10 people is now 169 medical centers and 1,744 people um, engaged in that network in over 30 different clinical uses um, and some for education and training as well, as you mentioned. So the, the Wait, how many different, how many, say that again, how many different clinical use cases? Over 30. Over 30, okay. Right. Over 30 clinical uses. So that includes everything from... Uh, uh, physical therapy, depression. What what are some of the other use cases? Substance PTSD, use disorder, anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD, uh, suicide prevention. We've got uh, procedural use, so peri perioperative use of VR before, during, and after. That was one of the. the uh, Caitlin has a picture of the first veteran to use VR um, in the operating room. I think that was October of twenty twenty one. Is that right, Caitlin? I'm trying to remember those dates. Um, 
there's just some, some fascinating milestones that's really been driven by the engagement of the staff um, and the excitement of our patients. Uh, we we have we have since developed additional events and opportunities. We now do a, a leadership event annually called the Immersive Summit, where we bring executive leadership from VA and, and other industries and other government agencies because we recognize exactly what Caitlin was talking about. When you put a headset on, um, you have an experience, but you also observe may observe someone else having an experience. So that's where we use the hashtag heads and headsets. It's really become our mantra. Um, because we can talk about it for hours or you can put a headset on and experience um, the real impact of what this is doing. So you said 169 medical centers. Is that a, a geographically centered or is that spread out throughout the United States? Spread out throughout the United States. Great question. All 50 states in Puerto Rico, there's at least one headset in all 50 states in wow. Puerto Rico um, across VA. And, and that's what we know about. Uh, we know there are sites that are doing things that we're still learning about, but those are things that we, we know about and have supported. Uh, that's significant. That's that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. This is so impressive. I mean, this is yeah, it's amazing. This is really, really, really cool. On so many. Do you many have levels. any any stats you could share from some of those early studies or or even ongoing as far as um, patients experiencing positive results? Or have you guys had a chance to do any to wrap any research around the practices? Yeah. So Caitlin probably give you some numbers off the top of your head for sure. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, what we consider to be clinical implementation or what would some would consider like implementation science occurring across the VA. Um, there are some pockets of research occurring as well. Um, so we do have some researchers doing work with substance use disorders, uh, with phantom limb pain, with chronic pain, PTSD, um, in, you know, various ways. So we have some of that research happening too. Um, I do have some just key points from like some of the initial data that was collected. So that first project that I developed in Asheville, um, they now have seen within those inpatient wards, uh, they've done over 600 sessions um, with patients and that encompasses now over 400 unique veterans at just that one medical center. Um, and that doesn't include all use cases. That's primarily for inpatient use and primarily for things like pain and anxiety management. Um, in that population, um, you know, we see an average of about 30% decrease in pain intensity uh, with just a single session, which is a pretty large number. Um, we use the Defense and Veterans um, Pain Rating Scale within the VA, which is kind of a combination of numbers and facial expressions and colors to kind of help patients describe their pain intensity level. Uh, we typically see uh, at least a one point drop on that scale in 68% of veterans um, and some like 30% experience a three plus point decrease in pain. So like going from like worst pain you've ever imagined, 10 out of 10 down to seven out of 10 down to zero in some cases, which is huge. Um, also seeing uh, basically similar results between acute and chronic pain, which is really interesting for the veteran population and makes a lot of sense because most of our patients have um, chronic pain diagnoses, a lot of them do. So when they're experiencing acute pain, it's usually acute on chronic pain. Uh, so it's experienced a little differently. Uh, with anxiety, um, about 84 to 85% um, have a complete decrease in anxiety levels following or during a single session. Um, and coming out of that one too, you know, we've seen work with, uh, cognitively impaired, uh, patients, uh, not just at the Asheville VA, but at several VAs. And, um, I have some data recently from a community living center pilot that we are running, uh, within the Vision 4, um, which is most of like, uh, most of Pennsylvania. I think there's some, some other states that are involved in that vision, but a lot of it is within Pennsylvania and there's nine community living centers, which is like our short-term rehab, long-term care hospice uh, that are currently using a virtual reality platform to impact social isolation, pain, anxiety, as well as behavioral concerns, um, most likely related to cognitive impairment, where we're seeing some significant decreases in restlessness, uh, tearful and sad behaviors, agitation, 
Um, and I have some great patient stories related to those sort of behaviors, but, um, and even in that population seeing, you know, an average 46% decrease in pain intensity, um, an average of about 40% reduction of anxiety, um, and also subjective units of distress or the SUD scale seeing about a 35% decrease there. Um, and that's across about at this point over a hundred sessions, um, and about 85 different unique patients. Wow. I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned earlier the story of uh, somebody who was in excruciating pain, tossing and turning, they put on a headset, and then next thing you know, they're out cold, they're, they're asleep. Could you share, just for, for those that, of us that have never even, don't understand how something that happens in a headset could affect your mental state, could you share some of one of the pieces of content, whether for chronic pain or for anxiety, how do you, how do you have such profound effects with something that's happening inside a headset? Well, I think it really speaks to the, you know, the level of uh, immersion and that sense of presence within a virtual reality headset where they really are taken out of the, their real world setting, uh, where they may be bombarded by all of these negative stressors, whether that is pain or anxiety or, you know, potentially triggering of their PTSD, you know, whatever that looks like, that outside world, they have all of those input signals coming to, you know, their sensory system. So if you can interrupt that signal in some way using a highly immersive technology like virtual reality, you're taking them out of that, you know, stressful real world scenario that they're currently in and putting them into a world where those negative stressors all of a sudden do not exist. So you take them from the white four scary walls of a hospital room or the the walls of an operating room and you put them into a, a natural environment where they're sitting beside a fire in the mountains by a river and they're listening to birds and they see butterflies and deer and they can walk around in nature instead, then you are totally interrupting that negative stressor signal to their brain. You know, even if it's a temporary distraction, that kind of distraction is huge. So, you know, I mentioned those patients that have chronic pain, they're in pain all the time. But if you have a patient that you can put in virtual reality headset and all of a sudden that pain signal is interrupted for the first time in 15 years and they all of a sudden don't feel pain for the first time in 15 years because they've never found something that distracts them from it as well as virtual reality does, you can imagine the level of impact for a patient. Because I've seen patients in tears because they've not felt that in such a long period of time. Jeez. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so amazing. I have so many questions. Um, like just some practical questions. Just I'm curious. Like, what? Where are you getting content? What type of content? What types of device headsets are you using? How did you pick the headsets that you picked? Maybe start there. And I have several more. So we're using a wide variety of content. I think what matters most to us um, is what problem are you trying to solve? What in indication are you trying to impact? In addition to that, um, what what pa what's the patient population? Are they okay to use hand controllers? Does it need to be eye gaze? Does it need to be relaxing content? Is the content sensitive to any anything that might be tr triggering to a veteran? Um, additionally, is the company willing to, to think about um, how their content, how their... Uh, platform interacts with the healthcare environment and specifically with a veteran environment. So we, one thing that we've learned and care a lot about is uh, we know that tech companies and VR companies can create phenomenal experiences in VR. They may or may not have, have incorporated the healthcare perspective in the actual design and development process. So it's very important to us that as we work with companies that they're flexible and, and willing to for us to be able to say to them, look, great concept. But this was, is what would really make it something that we could really implement and scale across our healthcare system. Um, primarily in order to scale things more quickly, we've taken more of a single app or kiosk mode approach. Um, while we also are working with Office of Information Technology, the Privacy Office, Information Security, all those things, because you can imagine um, there are, as there should be, a lot of security and data protocols that we need to make sure are in place. and. Um, risk analysis and things like that are done. We did not want that to slow down the implementation, us get, being able to get these tools into the hands of our veterans and clinicians. And so the way we do that is just silo the devices. 
Um, so it means that often what we're purchasing is actually a bundled concept where it's a headset with content on it. And so we're we're selecting less of the headset and more of the experience. Um, and, and certainly are continuing to learn what would make particular hardware or experiences better or more um, more personalized to different veterans or clinical uh, experiences. We're also developing our own content now, which is, is sort of something people, I imagine, don't expect VA to be doing. Um, we have four different uh, areas where we're developing content. Three are training and education for our staff and, and patients as well. And then one is specific to a patient um, scenario for chronic pain and suicide prevention. So that has been a lot of fun um, to be able to be on the ground level and to to give our staff and our veterans opportunity to say, hey, here's content that we're building. What do you think of it? What would make it better? What would make it um, fit your life um, and your experience more more directly? So that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I was curious about that. We've seen, you know, it feels like just the way Caitlin handled it in the very beginning, the value of the initial proof of concept is getting somebody in a headset and getting the results. And so we see a lot of companies start with the off the shelf and then depending on how well it goes, maybe transition to either building content in house or, you know, some large, some of our larger customers have acquired content studios. Uh, so I was, yeah, I was curious about that. What about like, what are just, I mean, you're in 160 locations, I think is what you said. And I don't know how many headsets, you don't have to share that if you want to, but like, what are some of the challenges like just practical challenges that you've faced going from that initial approval to now actually scaling out to multiple locations content at multiple locations managing the the results managing maybe the 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 practitioners who are implementing maybe walk through some of those challenges and how you, and how you've overcome them so we know well, you know as we've talked about the sorry you go ahead Anne. I was just going to say the number of headsets is over 1,200 from our national office. Um, that doesn't count the number of headsets that have been purchased at the facilities. But we know that from from us, uh, we've shipped out over 1,200 headsets. Um, and I think, it, and this is probably something Caitlin will, will speak directly to as well, so much of it, we have prioritized personal touch and repeatable processes. Um, so we want to make sure our priority is supporting our staff and supporting our veterans. Um, and so where there have been challenges for implementation, where people people will, especially early on, we would get emails about how do you turn the device on? How do you charge it? How do you, you know, and, and so we tried to, we tried to respond to those uh, quickly and seamlessly and also recognizing that, you know, grateful that we have people who don't know how to turn the devices on, but they're willing to use them with patients, right? So um, really trying to encourage that. and and in that process leveraging some support to document those questions that we were getting over and over and over again and build some resources around that so that's where we got our play that's how we built our playbook that's how we built the intro guide um it's gratefully we are getting phenomenal leadership support right now um, from our office so we've been able to add two people to our team on the va side as well as um, receive some contract support which has been critical for us. We now have um, about eight people supporting all of the staff across VA. So eight people to support 1,740. Um, we, we, we still have pretty crazy ratios if you think about it that way. Um, but but certainly do the best we can to make resources available to staff. But, but Caitlin, certainly go into more detail about those things. Yeah. Well, and our, our eight staff are definitely better than just the two of us that it's, it's always been up until that point. So um, but what I was going to add to that was that the, you know, we've talked about how the, the clinicians at the front line, the employees at the front line and the veterans have really pushed this forward because it's been something that started at the ground, you know, it's starting at that, that front line level rather than being a top down directive, um, within the VA, which I think, you know, now we're to the point where a top down directive would be helpful, but initially what has helped us is the fact that it was pushed forward by our frontline staff and our veterans. Um, so that being said, when it comes to having a successful implementation of immersive technology, engaged frontline champions of that particular pilot or that platform and that particular patient area is always key to success. And so involving the actual clinicians in the development of pilots, for example, so even our national pilots, we include the clinicians in the development of any 
resources that they might need, ask, you know, answering the questions that they frequently have. We include them in the discussions about what metrics are important to collect related to the use of this technology in this particular patient area. We're not just going to dictate to you what we think you should collect, what is important to you about your patient's use of this device so that they are taking ownership of that particular implementation from the very beginning. Um, and I think that's where some organizations may fail because they're trying to like push the technology on their clinicians without, you know, basically getting their support first and getting them highly engaged in it first. Because once you have that engaged clinical champion, then the rest of those processes become a lot easier in a lot of ways because it's them that need to figure out, okay, where does this fit into my existing clinical workflow? You know, they don't, you, they know their clinical workflows better than anybody else does. So it helps to have, you know, our team on the VA immersive side able to talk to these clinicians, say, okay, so we know that you are a, a PharmD in a, in a pain clinic within the VA. Tell us about what the work that you currently do so that we better understand where immersive technology might fit into that existing clinical workflow and then able to describe that back to you. So like we hear that you do this on a regular basis. How about in the 10 minutes prior to this, you offer virtual reality instead of this medication when you're you know meeting with a patient kind of thing. It allows us to help them in that integration of the technology rather than allowing them to just kind of fumble through that process blindly, because that's where you end up with a lot of clinicians that are overwhelmed. They get irritated that they can't figure it out immediately, and you'll end up with a lot of technology sitting on a shelf. You know, even if they know it's going to be powerful there for their patients, if they get overwhelmed in those initial days of trying to implement it, it's going to sit on a shelf. So that's where we try to step in through VA Immersive and provide all of the resources, all of the support, that they might need to really get that off the ground and make it sustainable because we help them to integrate that technology. That's a great takeaway for everybody listening, just the importance of being on the front lines, of, of holding hands. We we talk about at Arbor that we're, we're a river guide. So if like you're gonna get on the river, you want somebody who's gonna help you put on the life jacket, help you, you know, grab your hand to get you in the boat. Uh, you don't want somebody up in an ivory tower prognosticating about what you should do. It really sounds like that your team is taking that approach of getting there, getting your hands dirty. And I think that's just maybe what's required to adopt a new technology like this. Um, I want to, I want to ask a question that's kind of future oriented. You mentioned last year at AWE EU that your team is having to build processes for things like sending veterans home with headsets. As you look into the future, you know, the next three to five years, and as the use cases I mean, you're at 30 right now, which is insane. But as the number of headsets expand and, and your footprint expands, what are you thinking about in terms of uh, what's, the, what's the future look like for the VA with XR? Well, for, for one, we're already sending virtual reality headsets home with patients. Uh, are so you? we okay. are here to help wow. that pathway. Okay. Can you give me 30 seconds on that? I want to hear how, how does that work? Uh, yeah. That's great to hear. Um, yeah, no, that is a big change from October. I didn't even think about that. But um, so we have a couple of different pilots right now, actually a few um, that are looking at sending virtual reality devices home with patients for a different use cases. So one of which being chronic pain. Um, we have an 18 site pilot that'll be sending devices home with patients for that purpose, evaluating that particular platform. Um, and we had to work with VA privacy um, and information security and, you know, individuals to actually build those processes. Like, what does it mean to send a device home with a patient? Who needs to be involved? Prosthetics? Is it connected care? VA privacy? Whose data is it? All of those sort of questions. And those are the sort of things that we are now able to answer and are working to develop repeatable processes at the national level so that any site can still take that same path, no matter if it's at the national level or at a single site. So we are actually doing that for chronic pain. We're working on for PT and OT, um, pain management in general in relation to those rehabilitation um, therapies. What else do we have right now? Looking at potential for peer support. Yeah. Business and care models. I mean, that's another piece of the puzzle as well. You know, we 
we recognize and appreciate how engaged our frontline staff and veterans have been as well, but we also know that in order for this to really be woven into how VA delivers care, we need to make sure that our, our leaders see the value and see the return on investment. And VA is able to take some risks early on that other healthcare systems can't because we're payer and provider. So we don't have to worry as much about reimbursement and some of those things that fortunately are starting to come into play. Uh, but for us, we're able to show, we, we, we are incentivized to pro, to encourage wellness, well-being, um, and, and to, prevent, to prevent illness. Um, so we have a lot of opportunity to leverage VR for that. I think, too, another thing that we see that's going to be interesting to think how we fold into the care model of send, sending devices home with veterans is, you know, as a pharmacist, Caitlin's really heard me say this a hundred times, we, we prescribe medications for indications. And so um, a patient's diagnosed with di- type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, whatever, we prescribe particular medications for that. Um, and those medications are very specific to that indication and may even cause side effects that we then need to manage with other medications or other things. What we're seeing with VR that's really fascinating and I think really important is we may be recommending a patient try a headset for acute pain, uh, but what we also see is in that patient's PTSD may be impacted, their anxiety, their depression, their sense of wow. social isolation, their, you know, all these other things. Um, and so, uh, and if they experience adverse effects, cyber sickness, you take the headset off, right? You can't spit a pill back out, but you can take a headset off. And so the risk is really low with a really high, seemingly a really high return on investment. Um, and so we want to continue to to prove that out. Um, and the easier we can get, the, you know, the easier we can make this to send these devices home with veterans and, and support them. We we had an event, um, I, I mentioned earlier, the Immersive Summit where we had all the leaders come. We also had a veteran panel at that event and the veterans, one of the veterans said, great, you're doing these events for your leadership to, for, to, for them to experience VR. Are you doing it for your patients? Are you doing it for veterans? And at the time we didn't have an event that was specific to veterans. And so we developed this event we call the Veteran Experience, or VXR, and uh, we offered it for the first time in Orlando in December, but we are planning to do it. I think we have four or five planned around the country over the next year. And basically for four or five hours, we open the doors of a medical center. We surround it. We, we fill a room with headsets and we say, you know, this isn't a clinical visit, but we want you to come and experience these um, this content. Tell us what you think about VR in general, but about these experiences and these different uses. And so for the first one, we had 44 veterans show up and 56% of them had never used VR before. Um, and they, 98% said it was easy to use or very easy to use, which is really important when you're thinking about technology and, and patients. And then we ask, you know, scale of one to 10, one being terrible, 10 being life-changing, what would you, how would you rate your experience with VR? And the average was 8.3. Um, and then we said, would you like to have more VR use at the hospital? Um, in the clinic, 95% said yes. And we said, would you like to have it more at home for your health care? And 95% said yes. So that's all we need to know, right? Our veterans can use it. Yeah, what more yeah. of it? So, uh, so let's go. And it's work. We don't even know it works, right? So, yeah, that's... This is... Uh, thank you so much for joining us. This has been so um, impressive, profound... And and just your your willingness to be so open with how you've walked this out, some of the results you've seen, um, it's just super super encouraging. Maybe as we wrap here, uh, if you had one or two pieces of advice to somebody in your shoes, you know, six years ago or four years ago, whatever it is, who's thinking about starting a new initiative or on the they're on the front end of a proof of concept in their company or their their hospital, what, what maybe are a couple pieces of, of advice that you would offer? I think number one is you have to experience the value. And so make sure that you're, you're facilitating opportunities to get heads and headsets because that's going to build your champions and it's going to also help you tell the story. Um, the second piece of the puzzle I think has been really cl- critical is collaboration and build a community around it. Because what we know is as people experience, they become more and more advocates for it. Um, and Everybody working together is really what changes the tide, right? Um, we're, a, we're a ginormous healthcare system that cannot deny when you have 1,700 staff who are saying, we want more of this, right? So that, that piece of working together and understanding and sharing lessons learned and resources has been really critical to help lower the burden 
um, and, uh, and raise the standard for how we do this. Yeah, that's powerful. I, it, it's interesting. That's something that's come up in different ways. You know, I think people think about the technology component, the content component, experiencing the, the content, but just the people part, right? Like, and, and the, I don't want to say politics because it has a negative connotation, but kind of the politics of bringing a new technology into an organization is so important. So um, this has been so good. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to talking again soon. Thank you guys for having us. This has been a blast. Man, so many cool use cases. Um, goodness, you think about somebody with chronic pain for 15 years for the first time not having pain, you think about reducing pain from a 10 to a five or five to a zero, just it's impressive. And I think, you know, they are true pioneers, they're leaders in the space. And I love, I love the approach that they've taken of getting their hands dirty, working on the front lines, yep. uh, but also how they've, they've really learned uh, the importance of uh, winning those champions. And if you win the champions and you put the time in with, with, the, with the champions within your organization, uh, you let them tell the story and it helps the thing grow. So true. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about as we were listening to them sharing some of those incredible stats. Um, 10 years ago, when we were looking at XR in the medical space, it was still really at the academic level. It was, it was papers about, you know, PTSD and anxiety. And here we have a scaled use case. I mean, 169 locations, all 50 states in Puerto Rico. Um, it just, to me, it's pretty wild to hear about the scale that they're at. I mean, we, we've got 200 plus uh, medical companies, healthcare companies on the Arbor XR platform, and there's such a range of use cases. I mean, we didn't even get into physical therapy, um, the surgical applications. So to me, I think XR is here. Uh, the medical space is one of the highest impact spaces that I've heard of. And I think for us at Arbor, you know, we got into this so that we could make a positive impact. And we believe that um, XR at its best should be should give us our time back. It should make a positive impact in the world, not just be used for for more distraction. Uh, however fun zombie slaying is in, in XR, um, medical the medical use cases really get us excited. So fantastic episode. Looking forward to talking to to them more and hearing updates. Uh, yeah, yeah, very very exciting. Uh, well, as always, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, make sure you subscribe wherever you consume your podcast, and we look forward to seeing you next time.